Well, hello everyone. My name is Sarah. Welcome to The Heights. Our mission is to love God, love others, and to live it out. We want to help you on your journey to become a fully devoted follower of Christ. The best way to get connected is to scan the QR code located at the seat back in front of you. This will take you directly to our website where you can stay connected or even give online. Thank you so much for joining us today. Are you a part of a Heights group? This is an important part of your discipleship journey. We have new groups starting on next Sunday, April the 18th. To find out more about these groups or our current groups, you can go online to theheightsbelmont.org slash connect or scan the QR code located at the seat back in front of you. Don't forget, Second Prime will be next Thursday, the 15th, from 11.30 to 1.30. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Collections, we are needing soap and washcloths. If you're new with us today, we are so glad you're here. For us, being part of the church is so much more than just a Sunday service. We want you to know that there's a place for you here at The Heights. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week at theheightsbelmont.org. We believe God has something unique planned for you, and we want you to feel His love stronger now than ever before. Thank you again for joining us today. Good morning. Let's all stand together. Who knows that there's nothing our God can't do, amen? Let's give Him praise this morning. Just one word and calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word darkness has to retreat just one touch i feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can do there's not a mountain that Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, you revive every dream. Just one.
so I know I'm gonna overcome As long as you're in it The story's not finished I know you've overcome So I know I'm gonna overcome As long as you're in it Sing this together, family.
Forgiven really loud. And I've been washed by the blood. Amen. Amen. You guys sound great. Let's pray together this morning. Jesus, thank you so much for the blood that you shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. And thank you, God, that we were able to come together last Sunday in the yard and to proclaim that you are a risen Lord, a risen Savior. And we thank you so much that because of that, we are free. Because of that, we have a reason to worship you this day. So God, we worship you in spirit and in truth, and we thank you so much for this Sunday morning that we can gather together in person and in this place to worship your holy name, to lift your name on high. It's all about you, Jesus. So God, may something that we have sang or something that Pastor David is going to proclaim just pierce someone's heart today where it needs to be. God, do your thing. We thank you so much for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. to be a parent? Nope. Mm. Okay, maybe a little bit. We got this thing outnumbered. It's two grown-ups who gets one little bitty baby. We got this. Ronnie. His name is Ronnie. When it comes to raising kids, the days are long, but the years are short. Short enough, if you ask me. Tonight, we need to talk about Kate. She was... I guess hitting other kids in church yesterday. Okay, we'll talk about it. Great. I'm so glad you're interested in your kids' lives. Honey, the only reason that Kate is still here is because she is too young to leave. You know what? This is going nowhere. Sit down! Just leave me alone! And she's falling right after Ronnie. Look me up sometime. Bye, Mom. We're coming up after her. She's not your real mom anyway. Your real mom couldn't handle you. And they're gonna follow right after her. Honey, we have got to get help. Our kids aren't the problem. It's us, man. You can't run around living life one day at a time. You gotta know where you're going. And then lead. Here we go. And that will be your legacy. There's no legacy of faithful love. We just have to remember our job is to be faithful. Change is up to God. All right, like arrows, it'll be movie night next Sunday night at 6 here in the sanctuary. There'll be activities for preschool children and youth so parents can come enjoy the movie. And uh, we'll have plenty going on for the kiddos. Also, next week we'll be beginning Heights small groups just for parents called the Art of Parenting. Uh, the study will guide you in a biblical approach so that you can reduce stress in the home and increase harmony in the home. This study is great for uh, parents who have kids, babies through middle school, and there'll be different days and times available. 
There's actually a table set up over here, and you can also find out more information online. Um, I am uh, David Frady. I'm children's pastor. If you've never met me, uh, Pastor Raymond is on vacation, and uh, I had the opportunity to fill in, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I want to ask you to pray. Some of you may know Pete Brown in our church. Uh, Brother Pete passed away yesterday. Uh, Terry and Julie Potts' son uh, passed away very unexpectedly this week. Uh, funeral will be Saturday, so if you'll remember them in prayer. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm going to be reading verses 10 through 17. I'll be referring from time to time to verses 1 through 9. But our text is going to be 2 Timothy chapter number 3. <clears throat> Verse number 10 says... You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The chapter we are just reading and we're going to focus on today is one that ought to open the eyes of any parent. It, it should speak to those of us who are young parents, who are maybe more seasoned parents, who are even more seasoned parents, and who are the most seasoned parents. See, we don't know a whole lot in this passage about Timothy's parents, but we do have a reference to Timothy's mother and grandmother in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. <clears throat> I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. This speaks of the importance of grandparents and parents in rearing their children. This sincere faith that was spoken of in this passage, it was passed on from Timothy's grandmother and to his mother and then on to Timothy. But a good question comes to mind, and that is, what about Timothy's father? We don't know anything of Timothy concerning his father. It's Actually, it's the absence of his mention in Scripture that is definite. Many feel that he wasn't the spiritual leader that he could have been or that he should have been, and that is the reason that he is not mentioned. And this ought to serve as sort of a spiritual espresso to us men today. Our children need us to be present. They need us to be engaged in guiding them spiritually. So if you don't get anything else out of this today, men, I implore you to consider your role that you play in the life of your children. But due, it, due to the absence of his father and his spiritual upbringing, God sent Paul into the life of Timothy. Paul would serve as Timothy's spiritual mentor or spiritual father. You may be here today and have not, have not had the experience that you had a father or a mother uh, in your life that was a spiritual influence that they could have been and they should have been. But I want you to know that it is entirely possible that that might be true, that God can send somebody into your life to serve as a spiritual role model to you. And some of us, it might be his, his plan for us to be a spiritual mentor to others. You all, may also be a single parent who is doing your absolute best to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And you feel like sometimes it's, you just want to throw up your hands and you want to give up. But I want you to know you can do it. You might be a grandparent that has unexpectedly uh, taken on the task of raising your grandkids. And it's sometimes more than you can feel like you can shoulder, but I want you to know that you can do it with God's help and with a shoulder, a church that will stand shoulder to shoulder with you and help you as you raise your kids. So Paul begins to give his son in the faith, Timothy, some advice. And in this passage of scripture, we'll notice three things, the first of which 
Paul looks at a place of wonderment. A place of wonderment. So we open 2 Timothy 3, we see that word, but. Now that word is in some form or fashion, it's tying together what Paul just spoke about with what he's getting ready to speak about. And so what is he, what is he trying to do here? He's trying to paint a contrast. He just taught in chapter number th- two about those things that, that ought to be taught from the scripture that people need to learn, that our children need to learn. But then in chapter 3, he's going to point to and contrast that with false teachers that were present in that day. He contrasts uh, the, the things that should be taught with the things that should not be taught, with the way that we should live and the way we should not live. And he contrasts Timothy with the false teachers of that day. So I encourage you sometime to go back and read chapter number 2. But Paul says that that Timothy knows all about his teaching. He knew exactly what what Paul had taught. He fully understood it and he accepted that. And he, he, he fully accepted the way that Paul lived as well. He had joined Paul in service so he knew exactly what Paul was teaching. He was convinced of the truth. But, but Paul begins to tell Timothy of the plight of the current culture. He said that there are these false teachers and, and Paul begins to warn uh, Timothy about them. And what, what you got to know is while Paul was an aged apostle at this point, that Timothy was still relatively young. He's a relatively young pastor who's, um, who's pastoring a church and he's, he's uh, helping people to grow in their relationship and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. But I want you to know something. All of us know that it can get awfully discouraging at times, but can I tell you that those who serve in ministry as pastors, it can be particularly discouraging. Now, I don't want any violins and I don't want any, uh, I don't want any uh, weeping and wailing or anything like that. But it can be pretty discouraging. Because just as Paul told Timothy, you know, it's easy to look at at what you're doing and feel like you're not making it anywhere. It's true for for most pastors. But Paul tells Timothy, these false teachers, they've been around since the very beginning. Nothing, Nothing is new in that regard, he says. Because he says in verse 8, just as Janus and Jambres also oppose Moses, so also these false teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. These names are not mentioned again in the Bible. They're likely magicians who walked around trying to emulate the uh, things that God did through Moses. They tried to look like they uh, were religious. But the Bible says they were not accepting the truth, so they were rejected. He's telling Timothy, look, these false teachers have been around. They're going to be around. They've been around since the beginning of time. They'll be around until Jesus comes back. But you've got to know that this is the plight we're in. Secondly, he talks about the people. As we shift our focus to what Paul is saying to Timothy in chapter number 3, we see that Paul names the traits that will mark many as we move closer and closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus. It is the people that Paul warns Timothy about as a father in the faith, that if you'll notice, they're present in the culture that we live in today and they're paraded around in front of our kids. They look nice, they dress nice, they speak very eloquently, they're very very convincing, but my friend, they're wrong. I was watching social media. I like to watch a lot of pastors on social media. And uh, I was watching a, a clip of one pastor and he told his congregation that they were little gods. Yeah, that's what he said. He said that his congregation are little gods, just as Moses spoke to, uh, God spoke to Moses in the wilderness and told him, I am, he was saying that you are as I am, and that you are little gods just like me. His word's not mine. Folks, I got a problem with that. And here's why I got a problem with that. My Bible tells me that God is so different. He's so other, so distinct than me and you. And we'll never be a God. We'll never be God. We'll never even sniff being close to what God is. And yet this is what's being taught. 
false teaching in our culture. Our kids may go off to college, and statistics say that when they come back from college, 65 to 80% of them no longer believe. So he starts off this list, he's talking about, he says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Paul starts off this list with this, this bad seed that produces all the other fruit here. And I want you to know that in our culture today, people love themselves more than anything. They're all about what they want, what they desire, what they need, what they can get. And as they become consumed with themselves, they are lovers of money. They're boastful. They're proud. They're abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Hello. It's where we are. Every single one of those traits are present in this culture. Adults who are selfish, boastful, and proud, they didn't just wake up that way. Along the way, they were ungrateful. They were disobedient to their parents. They're unforgiving. They're out of control. They had abuse and unholiness and unforgiving spirit, slander and conceit modeled for them in the home. Those traits are, one, are those mentioned by Paul to Timothy as evidences of individuals who will be in this world in the last days. The most concerning comment from Paul of those individuals in that passage is in verse 5 having a form of godliness, but denying its power. In spite of the fruits that they put out there, in spite of those things, those people mentioned put on an appearance or a semblance of the godly. What does that mean? It means they put on a good act. It means they're a phony. They, over in Ephesus, they masqueraded around as spiritual people. But the sad news was, even though they were phony, phonies, people lined up behind them and followed them. And friends, I want you to know something. Nothing has changed today. People get a, a sniff of a little bit of a truth. And they're willing to line up behind a person that teaches just enough of the truth to be dangerous, to lead people astray. And they're not able to determine that because they didn't learn the Bible in the first place for themselves. If we don't teach our kids to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and teach them to obey Him, to know His Word, to love Him, to worship Him, and to serve Him, they're going to follow these very individuals that were present in that culture that are present in our world today. It's a literal battle for the souls of our kids. Several years ago, it was right after my father died, um, we had a big English bulldog. She was white. I call her the brute. She was just big dog. Her chest was about that wide. But she was the sweetest, goofiest little girl you, you ever seen in your life. And so one day I went out to feed her, and when I went towards her kennel, she was barking like I've never heard her, and she was down on her front paws, and I thought, something is wrong. So as I got closer, I saw a copperhead that was coiled up outside at the corner of her kennel and was hissing at her, and she was just going ballistic. So I thought, you know, the copperhead's going to bite my dog, so I went inside to get my 9 millimeter. I started out the door. My wife says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to shoot this copperhead that's going to bite Cheyenne. She jerks the gun away from me and says, let me shoot it. <laughs> now, guys, let me tell you something. If you got a woman that says, let me kill the snake, she's a keeper. <laughs> right? And so, so she went out there with that gun, and I go out towards the kennel. She says, grab Cheyenne. And so I grabbed Cheyenne. She didn't have a collar on. I had to grab her by the nap for her neck. Her, her nap was so big, I had her like this. And she would pull away from me. And when she did, my wife, Sherry, would say, grab Cheyenne. And I said, shoot the, shoot the snake. And she would 
aim again and Cheyenne will pull away again, I'd say, if you don't shoot that snake, I'm going to grab that gun and I'm going to shoot it. And finally she shot it and shot it and shot it. I thought, boy, I hope I never make her mad. I'll look like a Swiss cheese. Here's the thing. As serious as that was trying to protect our dog from being bitten by a snake, you know what? Literal battle for the souls of our kids is an even more intense battle and more is at stake. Guys, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm not overstating this. I'm not overstating this. Sometimes we take for some reason what pastors say and we say, oh, he's just overreacted. You cannot overreact to the, to the fact that in our culture, in our world today, this, that Satan has targeted our children. And he is, he is doing everything he can to destroy homes, to ruin lives, to, to, to keep children from coming to, to know him because he knows that if he can keep them from coming to know him and they can live their whole lives for him, the difference that they can make for the kingdom of God, and he is doing all he can to stop it. He also speaks here, Paul does, of persistence. Verse 6, they are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. The idea of a slithering worm ought to be pretty clear to all of us. Um, have you ever seen when it, when it rains and the worms uh, crawl out onto the sidewalk and then the sun comes out, they slither their way trying to get up under a rock or something so they can get back to moisture? Well, here's the idea that we're talking about here. They slither into homes. And particularly, Paul says they target these uh, single women and try to gain control over them who, uh, because they're gullible and they're loaded down with sins and they're swayed by all kinds of evil desires. They prey on the weak. It's happening everywhere we look these days. Single women, single parents, those who are weaker children, Satan is slithering into the home, and it's never been easier to slither into the home than it is today. You don't have to step a foot in a door, you can be in a home because of social media. These false teachers, they get their, 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 their dirty, dirty hands on these, these women and these weaker and these, these children, and they grab hold of them and a lot of times it may be through addiction and, and, and things of that nature these religious charlatans are, they're still still present today they creep in undetected and, 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 and they get in the home but, but the most telling thing about what goes on here is found in verse number 6 when Paul says these women were always learning but never come to a knowledge of the truth I remember when I was a kid, my, uh, my mom sometimes would get frustrated with me and she said, I'm not going to tell you again because you won't listen anyway. I know none of you ever heard that from your parents. But you know what? That's what's being said here. These individuals are being taught by false teachers who are being taught a little bit of the truth with a whole lot of untruth. And they're learning, they're learning, they're hearing, they're being taught, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. Isn't it, it's, it's possible that as you, you, you grow up in church or maybe you grew up in a Christian home or, or maybe you, 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 you've been involved in Bible study or whatever, it's entirely possible that maybe you have been taught the truth, but you were just hearing information. You, you just never received it. You never, you never had an, a knowledge of the, the truth. You never understood the truth. So what happens to these false teachers? Do you ever wonder about that? What happens to them? Well, Paul said they won't get very far, but as, it, as in the case of those men, speaking of the ones mentioned who were uh, false teachers with Moses, their folly will be clear to everyone. What does that mean? It means they'll be exposed. Y'all hear me right now. There are lots of false teachers being exposed all across this country. Everywhere you look, it's happening. 
Now, you, listen to me. It doesn't make me happy. It hurts my heart. I know some of those men. But you know what? If you hear me teaching something that's contrary to the Bible, you let me know. But if, if other individuals are teaching contrary to Scripture, shame on them. Shame on them. And they will be exposed. They will be exposed. It's important that we make sure our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, that they are trained in a knowledge of the truth. It is only by having a knowledge of the truth that one can accept the one who's, who's faithful and true. And so Paul looks back and he looks forward at a place of wonderment. And Paul speaks of, he speaks of those struggles. He speaks of the people and he speaks of persistence. Look at this. This persistence is mentioned in verse number six. But then he moves on. He moves on to verse number 10. And it may seem that Paul is, is bragging, but he's not. He's talking about the persecution that comes even though we're persistent. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a God to the life of Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone will. Now, I know there are people that give us the idea that when we accept Christ that everything will be absolutely beautiful. Smooth sailing, no hardship, plenty of money, all the money you can ever need because that's God's plan for us. I, if you have a problem with that, because you know what? My Bible tells me that anyone who wants to live a God of life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So who do you believe? Do you believe an individual that stands up and tells you everything's going to be beautiful and no problems, or you believe what the Bible says? Now see, See, I'm pretty simple-minded in that. I love people. But you know what? I love the Lord more than anything, and I trust Him and His Word more than any other person. Brother Frank over here is a fine Bible teacher, and I respect him and love him, but guess what? If something he teaches comes in con conflict with what the Word of God says, guess which side I'm going to fall on? Right? Sometimes, sometimes it's not about those individuals we have as friends. It's a, we need to really look at, look at what's being said, what's being taught, what's being lived in front of us, and what we're living in front of our kids. Follow here, here is defined, to conform, uh, defined as to conform to someone's belief or practice by paying special attention. So Paul paid attention to what, what uh, excuse me, Timothy paid attention to what Paul was saying, what he was doing, but he paid attention to the way he was living. Parents, listen to me. Your children are watching you, and what, the way that you live speaks volumes about the, the what, what you say more than what you say. You might say you believe anything. You might say you believe in Christ. You might say you live for Him. You might say it's important. But if your your life speaks otherwise, your children will hear what you do more than they hear what you say. As we follow Christ, Paul tells Timothy that we're going to live for Him that everyone will face persecution. And he's encouraging him with this. He's saying, Timothy, you're going to face times of hardship. You're going to have struggles and disappointments and difficulties. But remember this, the Lord is with you as he, he was with me. Anybody that faced persecution and could testify to that, it was the Apostle Paul. Rocks thrown at him chased from town to town, threatened with death, thrown into prison. He faced it all, but he could look at Timothy and say, you remember, God was with me every time. He never left me, and he'll never leave you. And that's what our children need to learn. Our children don't need to be taught that everything's going to be absolutely beautiful uh, when, they, when they come to know Christ. They need to be taught that 
there's going to be difficulties that will come. Things will happen. It'll get hard. But in spite of that, God will not leave them. If we don't teach them the truth, if we don't teach them that there's going to be difficulties, but God will not leave them, when those things happen, they're going to believe that something's wrong with them. Or they're going to believe that God has ceased to love them. And they need to know that these things are going to happen, but God never leaves them and He never ceases to love them. They need to learn that during these struggles and trials that they need to cling to the hand of Jesus and draw closer, closer to Him and, and, and go deeper in their relationship with Him and hold on to Him with every ounce of their being. Um, we took our kids to Disney several years ago. Uh, been more than several now. I know some of you have probably been to Disney. Uh, it's quite a trip. It's a great place, but it's very exhausting. And we took, uh, see, Jake would have been about seven or eight. Um, and so he was at that age. He was all boy. He was going to do everything. Uh, it was really magnificent. But <laughs> we get on the ride Expedition Everest. I know some of you have been on that ride. And so what, what it is is a big roller coaster, and it's going down all these hills and these curves and everything, and it comes down a big hill, and it feels like you're going about 150 miles an hour. And you come back up a hill, and as you look up, the end of the tracks are in sight. It was marvelous. I looked over at Jake, and his eyeballs were this big around. And he looked like he had swallowed a golf ball. But he had a hold of my arm with a death grip. And still to this day, if I take this jacket off, his fingerprints are on my arm. No, just kidding. <laughs> but here's what I want you to know. Well, our kids need to learn that they need to grab on to Jesus. When things get tough, they just hold on to him as tight as they can. They need to be taught that. Thirdly and finally, Paul teaches about the power of his word, the power of his word. And this is, if we don't, we don't teach our kids anything else about what I'm saying today, they need to get this one right here. They need to stand on this right here. While evil, evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the scripture of the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Then he says this, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a, sovereign, a, a somber remind, reminder to parents who have children who have been trained in the word of God that those children are much better equipped for the rigors of adulthood than children who are not trained in the Word of God. Just, just a fact. Paul tells Timothy, but as for you, continue what you have learned and become convinced of. Have learned in this passage carries with it the idea of intentional learning by inquiry and observation. Timothy did not, did not just stumble upon what he learned from Paul. It was intentional. It was intentional. And he did it with great fervor. He wanted to learn what Paul was teaching. He wanted to see how Paul was living. And so he committed himself to that. And he didn't compromise it. He didn't dilute it. He didn't water it down. A very telling statement by Paul in this passage is, because you know those who you learned it from. Y'all hear me today. There's one thing for truth to be taught. But there's another thing when you learn that truth from somebody that you love beyond a shadow of a doubt. I remember when I was a kid, I would go over to my Grandma Frady's house over here on Sloan Street in Belmont. And I would sit on one of those little leather ottomans at the end of her chair. And she had one of those leather rockers. Know, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And she would sit there and she had a a picture Bible and she would tell me Bible stories from that picture Bible and I've never ever forgotten the things that she taught me because I loved her so much did you know your children 
your children just, they love their parents. Do you know how powerful it is that your children are taught from the Word of God, but they're taught more effectively by the way that you live in the home as you allow your life to be transformed by God through His Word? And the powerful example that that can be, that's what Paul was talking to Timothy about because you know those from whom you learned it. He knew his grandmother. He knew his mother. He knew Paul. He loved each of them so intensely. And it was the truth that was taught by them to Timothy was so powerful because of his great love for them. That's where we as parents have got to answer the bell. Again, this speaks as much about our commitment to learning and growing and deepening our discipleship and growing in our knowledge of God and growing in our love for Him and our dedication to Him as it does anything that we can say or do to our kids. The verses 16 or 17 are, are some of the most significant verses in the whole of the New Testament. We're going to focus on those and then we'll be done for this morning. They declare the source of the Bible. The King James uses the word inspired to describe Scripture. The NIV reflects inspiration is quite a different word than what we, we know today. Verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for re teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, in Christ Jesus. Parents, I want you to know this morning. Scripture is a source of saving truth. It's a source of save, saving truth. The truth of the word mixed with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, leads to spiritual life. Timothy learned the word in the most marvelous of manners. He learned the word from the needs of his grandmother and his mother and from the life of Paul. And he was led to a saving faith. And that faith was first on display by his mother and his grandmother. That is why it is important that our children understand what is being said in verses 16 and 17. Listen to me. The Bible is God breathed. The literal translation is breathed out by God. God breathed out his words into the human writers to be written down. It was not merely some, some um, editors that were chosen by the uh, current leaders of the church to write down God's words. No, God breathed his words into the lives of these individuals that were chosen to write by him, and they wrote them down in their own personality. It is not men that were simply chosen. If these writers were sharing or writing apart from God's revelation, then it would be human, it would be fallible. And these writers were not inspired like artists are in our culture today to submit a rendering. Not inspired like athletes who are inspired to set a world record in track and field. It's not the same kind of inspiration. It is critical that we teach our kids that the scriptures are without fault. They are without error because they are breathed by God. As we begin to wrap up our study today, we are to, Paul says, these scriptures make us able to rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness. Reproof or rebuke is the act of admonishing a believer who has strayed from the teachings of the New Testament, whether in word or in deed. What does that mean? That means as parents to our children, when they messed up, we go to them and remind them, hey, you committed yourself to being a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. You messed up. And here's why you messed up, because here's what the Bible said. What it doesn't mean is we don't beat them over the head spiritually. We don't murder them. We don't, we don't, we don't, take them to task over it because chances are when they fail, they know they fail. What they need us to do is to, to lovingly, compassionately 
tell them where they are and what they've done. And then we correct. It's showing him or her by getting them back on course. Oftentimes that involves repentance. Repentance is a truth from the Word of God that many are avoiding saying in the world that we live in today. But you have to repent when you've sinned to turn away from your sin and turn back to God. Several years ago, we were going to Cocoa Beach, Florida. And I was driving. And we're driving down the road. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder if, if I missed a turn somewhere or something. Of course, my wife very quickly said, honey, I think you're going the wrong direction. Who needs Google anymore when you got a wife, huh? <laughs> and so I said, nah, I think we're good. About a minute later, she says, honey, you're going the wrong direction. And so I did what any man, good man would do to save peace in the car and in the family. I listened to my wife, and we got there a short time later. So, so, but we had to change our course. You know, correcting is changing your course. And sometimes we need somebody to help us to change course, to correct the course. And our children, our grandchildren, our family members, those kids that we're, we have under our influence, they need somebody to help them to correct their course. But then we need to help train them in righteousness. That's lovingly guiding them by example and by what God's word says and helping them to helping them to stay the course to grow and to stay the course and go the right direction that God would have them to go with their life what what do our children need most from us I mean I, I think that's a question most parents would probably ask themselves through t through time but Here's what I think that the passage shows us that we, they need from us. They need parents who know and love God about, above all else. The Christian life is more caught than taught. They watch what we do more than they watch what we say. Those students that I mentioned earlier that between 65 and 80% of them return from college and they no longer believe Several things have likely happened. Number one, they have sat under false teaching. Number two, they have not fully understand the teaching of God's Word. Or number three, they haven't consistently had somebody live an example before them in the home. We must live it before our kids. We must put God first in our lives if, if our children are going to grow up learning to love God and live for Him. Secondly, they need parents who teach and model confession and repentance of sin. You know, uh, at least in our home, boy, if you mess up in our home, our kids will call us on it. We got one uh, getting married in October, one getting married in May, and one that is never getting married. But they'll call you on it when you mess up. My, my, my youngest will tell me, say, Daddy, here's what you said. <laughs> if you're a single parent, you're a grandparent that's raising your grandkids, I want you to know that you can do it. You can do it. You can do it with God's help. With, with people who will stand lovingly beside you, behind you, and encourage you and help you all the way. Number four, kids need parents who are purposeful and intentional as they raise their kids. Purposeful and intentional. What does that mean? That, mean, that means that you're focused. You don't say, you don't say, here's what we need to do, and here's what we're about, and here's where we need to go. And yet your parents see, your, your kids see everything else from their parents but what you say. You don't tell them it's important they grow up learning the Word of God, yet they never get focused on being in church and learning the Word of God, right? 
We need to focus them, help focus them. I'm not trying to beat people up today. I'm trying to encourage you. They need structure and they need focus. And we need them to be focused on God and his word. And in the world that we live in, they don't need less focus on that. They need more focus on that. And it all starts with you as their parents. What are you teaching them at home? How are you living before them at home? Are you teaching them that God is first and foremost in your life? Are you encouraging them with that? Are you making sure that they are able to study and they understand the Word of God, coming to a knowledge of the truth? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Let's, let's pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you said, David, I hear you, but I've heard God. And I know that, that I've been more focused at times on uh, parenting my kids and making sure they're taught the truth and come to a knowledge of the truth. And at times, I've been more focused on making sure that I lived in a way that was, was pleasing to you. And I, I, I admit to you today, because God already knows this, and I want to testify to God that I can, I can and I should do a better job of fighting for the souls of my kids, of making sure that they see the way that I live and making sure they see and hear the word of God. I need to do a better job. I want to do a better job. I want to help my kids to know him. If that's you this morning, would you slip up your hand and say, pray for me? God bless you and you and you and you and you and you and you. You can lower your hands. Maybe you're here today and you just say, David, you know what? I, I have heard the Bible all my life and I've, grew up, I've grown up in church. But you know what? I don't know with a 100% assurance that I've ever accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And man, I, I need to do that if I'm ever going to point my kids in the right direction. If they're ever going to be everything that they should be and can be in you. I need, I need to accept Christ. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand and say, hey, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. You can lower your hands. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, we're going to have a time of invitation here. This is your opportunity to respond to what God is saying to you right here today. And what I'm going to do first is I want to say to those of you as parents who raised your hand and said, I need to be a better parent. So I want to be a be better parent. I want to commit myself to that today. And you need somebody to pray for for you and with you, would you get up right now and go to the center, center doors? There are people standing there that will help you. The center doors at the back of the auditorium, you can go there and somebody will pray for you and with you. Adam's going to begin playing. Your chance to respond. If you just raised your hand and said you weren't 100% sure you've ever accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And today, You'd be interested in, in, in calling out on him and asking him to save you, to, to wipe away your sins, to forgive you and be Lord and Savior of your life. I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it under your, under your breath. And it's nothing magic about the prayer. It's what you honestly mean in your heart. It's what you honestly mean. The Bible says if we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. And so I'm going to lead you through this prayer. And if you pray this prayer and you mean it, God will, he will save you. Pray with me, dear Lord Jesus. I realize that I am a sinner. I do believe that you died on a cross for my sin. That you were buried in a tomb. And that you arose on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and help me be Lord and Savior. Lord, be Lord and Savior of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant what you prayed,
Would you just raise your hand? You're, you're saying to God, I did it and I'm not ashamed of it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Here's what I encourage you to do. I know sometimes when we pray and accept Christ, it's somewhat, we don't, we don't want to seem awkward. But here's what I would encourage you to do. It'll help you begin your walk in your journey with Christ if you'll just go to somebody and tell them. If you'll go to a family member, if you'll go to somebody in the church, if you'll come to one of our pastors or somebody exiting the building today, and if you will say, I prayed and accepted Christ today. This should be the greatest day of your life. Parents, I want to pray for you right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for our parents, our grandparents, those who are seated in this room that have influence in the lives of kids. There is a spiritual battle. God, it's waging, it's intense. Lord, Satan, he wants to destroy our families, our homes. He wants to he wants to take the souls of the kids because he realizes what's at stake. But God, you are able. You are more powerful. And you have already won, a vi won the victory through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He has defeated death, hell, sin, and the grave. And God, I pray that you'd help our families, our parents, to cling to the hand of the Lord Jesus. And we would walk in victory. Thank you for what you've done in this service. We pray for blessing upon the reading and teaching of your word and upon each person as we leave here today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a good day.